Okay, buenos días. Uh, good morning to all of you and welcome to this panel where we are going to speak about regional integration as, uh, well, something that is <laughs> a topic that we have discussed for decades. This uh, regional integration has started up, has come to a standstill in a region that differently from Asia and Europe has not uh, really understood foreign trade as something that could help development. We're finally speaking again about regional integration, see how we can integrate value chains and our financial systems, still in a very incipient stage, of course, but I do believe that this will grow in a global context where we have protectionism and where the great leader of globalization is moving backwards and creating tariffs for aluminum and steel. We have with us the executive uh, secretary of Mexico, uh, Marcos Troyo who is the managing, no, I'm sorry, he says, the leader of the Brick Lab at Columbia University in New York. He has founded several initiatives. For example, he's a founder of Trade Initiative, Intelligent Tech, and he's the founder of Intelligence Diplomacy. And he's a fan of Corinthians. He's quite happy to be here. Well, an identity with football is very important. We should see if this will be a break to trade. Nicola Calicchio, a managing partner, Latin America at McKinsey. He formerly was a leader for Brazil, and his last sectoral work focused on consumption goods, and he has a very sound knowledge on value chains and opportunities to improve them. Alejandro Ramirez, the CEO of Cinepolis, the second largest uh, movie chain throughout the world. He's also the chairman of the Mexican Chamber of Business, representing the main capitals as well as a specialist on economies under development. He took place in the government and in OCDE in terms of development policies, therefore with very good knowledge. And Alicia Barcena, the executive secretary of ECLAC, the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, and expert in terms of development issues and working on an agenda for inclusion and for sustainable growth in Latin America. Once again, a very necessary voice in this debate on trade and growth for the region. I would like to begin precisely with Alicia to hear from her how this region that has been so resistant to trade, thinking that trade would mean surrendering your domestic market, how this is evolving to a different model. First of all, we have to put the problem in context. There has been an upscale of protectionism coming from one of the great promoters of free trade, which was the United States. Nowadays, this is in the hands of China. China seems to be the one fostering opening and free trade. And multilateral negotiations have not been very successful. The WTO meeting in Argentina pointed to these problems. We do have good news in the region, perhaps as a reaction to this uncertain and very turbulent situation due to the increase of tariffs in the United States, this race towards protectionism. Last week, and we had Secretary Guajardo in the signature of the Comprehensive Trans-Pacific Partnership. The 11 countries without the United States, of course, decided to sign this agreement, a very important 
signal to the region and to the world. Secondly, I see a greater opening in terms of Mercosur. Our panel members will show us that they're more willing to hold a dialogue with the European Union with advances and Brazil and Mercosur in general getting ready to negotiate with Canada and the Republic of Korea which means we have a new vision for the negotiation of Mercosur, the Pacific Alliance, which is good news for the region. It has opened up to four members, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and Singapore, already with a desire or will for convergence and divergence for a greater dialogue between Mercosur and the Pacific Alliance. And the five countries from Centro Central America uh, that have recently signed very concrete agreements with the Republic of Korea, Mexico, and Chile in turn are negotiating with the European Union and China is extending its proposal towards Latin America. At the recent meeting of CELAC in China, it was a ministerial meeting. Some agreements were made, and there is a new uh, look of China towards the region that has not materialized in trade terms or investments, except for a single issue that refers to steel. So they're no longer going to only buy commodities, but they will make productive investments. They are already acquiring important uh, companies in energy and electricity, as well as in Peru. So there is a change in China's strategy. To conclude, I would like to mention the problems that I foresee. Our region has decided to look for partners outside and not to integrate internally. The figures point to this. From the total exports in the region, only 17 percent are marketed among the countries of the region. The most integrated subregion is Central America with 32 percent, followed by Mercosur with a significant power among themselves. But in general, the figure is 17 percent compared with 65 percent for Europe and Asia with more than 40 percent. Europe and Asia have decided to become integrated and then to go outside. We are fragmented and we're individually negotiating with other countries. Now, which are the advantages of an integration? We can leverage manufacturing, SMEs, and value chains that you were mentioning, the integration of production and not the movement of goods and services how to go towards an integration of production and value chains, which are the problems. We have 20 million square kilometers with a very difficult geography, with poor infrastructure when it comes to transportation and communication. And uh, we, of course, gravitate towards the United States. <coughs> believe that United States and its policy is not only geared to Mexico. I don't believe this. I think that their look is geared to China using Mexico because this is a country with a surplus. United States has three or four large uh, economies that have a surplus, China, Germany, Japan, and Mexico. So many of their strategies are geared towards reducing their own trade deficit and, of course, this is impacting the entire world with the increase of tariffs in aluminum and steel. For the time being, Mexico is exempt from this. We will see what we hear from the secretary. They said that we would be exempt for a while. This is interesting. This could be a negotiation strategy. But I do believe that Latin America has to attempt to diversify its trade partners within the region. We are a very large market, 600 million people, and see how we can obtain that convergence between Mercosur and the Pacific Alliance. There are opportunities. Many will speak about this. The digital market is an excellent opportunity for integration, not as contentious and controversial as the other issues, perhaps the least controversial. 
and nothing like a good case to show what it means not to have integration. I was speaking to Alejandro Ramirez that has an important operation in Brazil who is working in the United States, Mexico, and India. This is a truly multinational company. What does integration mean and what does lack of integration mean for a company? Thank you, Alberto. I think that Integration basically means to be able to import easily without tariffs, with uh, little regulation, and it allows for the movement not only of goods and services, but also the movement of talent. Of course, there is the issue of intellectual property. We are in 11 countries in the region, in Mexico, Brazil, Argentina, and Chile, Colombia, Peru, and Mexico, and all of Central America. Basically, we have been lucky enough to invest successfully with few restrictions to FDI. In that sense, Latin America is highly integrated. When it comes to the exchange of goods and services, we have little integration. We can invest in all of the countries. We can export with different levels of ease. Some countries are more open than others. Historically, Brazil has been more protectionist than others in the Pacific Alliance, but there has been an evolution and gradually an opening. We are now faced with the threat of ending the free trade agreement of North America with uh, Canada and United States. We import a large amount of goods from uh, U.S. The, uh, corn that we use for popcorn is American because we don't produce this corn in Brazil. It is produced in Brazil. We have always imported this from Kansas, Missouri, and Iowa. Now that this threat looms, we have begun importing more from Argentina to test it. And although there are no tariffs for corn from any country to Mexico, the Argentine corn is 15% more expensive because of the logistic and the distance and the lead time of an additional 35 days compared to importing this from the USA. We haven't tested Brazil so far, but this is a product that we could replace if we have to cancel our uh, free trade treaty. And if we have a trade war, we do hope this will not happen. But we can do a great deal to become ever more integrated. This cost of 15% is due to the lack of infrastructure of logistics that we have in the region and trade facilitation. That represents a great deal of red tape in our countries. We need to advance in terms of trade facilitation in Brazil and Argentina. In Brazil, there is a great deal of red tape and we have seen a positive evolution in Brazil. When we came here 10 years ago to import a chair, we had to pay a tariff of 10%. This has been reduced to 4%. And something that we recall at Cinepolis that is tragic if we import cheese for nachos from Brazil to the United States when the container came to the customs in Rio de Janeiro, it was held back and they stated that the import license had changed. We could no longer import dairy products with that license. The cheese remained at customs for six months and of course was completely lost. This is one of those cases that should not exist. We should facilitate trade among countries in the region and with the rest of the world. Although there has been an evolution, there is still a great deal that we can do to facilitate the movement of talents, to bring Mexicans to Brazil or to take Brazilians or Chileans to Mexico. There is a regulation. In Mexico, it is difficult to obtain work visas for Latin Americans, for foreigners in general. It's too costly to take an expat from a co country in Latin America to Mexico and vice versa, or to bring Mexicans to Brazil, which tends to be a very tedious process. This also uh, could apply to higher education where we could have more university exchanges. And I would like to conclude with intellectual property in films. 
we see few South American films in Mexico and vice versa. We see very few films of Mexico and Brazil, Argentina, or Chile. What is happening is that the story of successful films are bought and a remake is being done in Brazil and will be previewed in two weeks in Brazil with Brazilian actors and, of course, in Portuguese. And one of the most popular comedies, If I Were You, Se Eu Fosse Você, is being replayed in Mexico. There is this exchange, but we still don't have that culture of watching films or content from other countries, as we can see on television. Uh, very interesting. Nicola, you are an expert from the viewpoint of companies. McKinsey has a very interesting study for 2017 that speaks about how Latin America could grow. Which is your vision of this issue of trade integration? Uh, you know, and I one on one, and uh, and I talk in in Portuñol, and and they laugh, but that's okay. But here in front of this important crowd, <laughs> I'd feel a bit embarrassed. So, I mean, <laughs> Miss Ibarra and and, and they they're very clear, and they touched on very important points, right? Clearly, infrastructure in Latin America is very poor, right? A client of mine told me that it's they are able to import cars from anywhere in the world into the the, the Spanish-speaking countries, other than Brazil, right? Even within our countries, you know, one of my other clients told me that it's cheaper to bring steel from China into Cali than from Bogota, okay? Wow. It's cheaper to bring steel from Cali, right, to Cali from China than from Bogota, right? I mean, it's completely crazy. And, and that is, I mean, a, a big barrier, no doubt about it. There are the mountains between Brazil and the other countries and so on and so forth. But I would argue that our lack of uh, integration is much more due to mindset. Mindset of ourselves, of our, I mean, our society, our, our leadership. And I would particularly blame ourselves Brazilians. I think that we Brazilians are a very closed society, unfortunately. And I say unfortunately because I think that the openness to other societies is what really drives progress. History has shown us that since, you know, the Middle Ages, whatever, right? That China, a very pro prosperous country, what did they do? They were scared, they put a wall, they go into 400 years of, you know, slow decline. Portugal and Spain, small countries, didn't have any resources. They go into an expansion and they conquer the world and they become great powers, right? So that's the history. History is telling us over and over and over again. Silicon Valley has more than 50% who are non-Americans, the, you know, genius visa, whatever, and, you know, I would claim that Venezuela's biggest problem of all is that they have closed the country. I mean, among them all, they want the lot that they have, but closing, it's the biggest one. So, openness, right, it's very important for prosperity. And Brazil, particularly, has a mindset of very closed country. Since, you know, many decades ago, the oil is ours, right? That's the slogan to do the Petrobras, right? Everything is ours. We want everything. We hate everything that's from abroad, right? And even we are scared with competing with all respect with some other Latin American countries. With all respect, right? Brazilian, Brazil, with our size. I mean, we shouldn't be scared, right? Um, we should be eager to, to, um, to, to celebrate, to, to, to integrate. Naturally, what happens is Mexico is very close with the U.S., integrates with the U.S., Chile, you know, uh, one of my favorite countries, opens itself to the world, and Brazil is a little bit isolated, right? And then the mindset translates recently in some ideology as well, right, of connecting Brazil with Venezuela, Cuba, whatever, right? I mean, with all respect to these countries, these are not the global leaders that, you know, you know Brazil should have commerce with. So anyway, I, I would say that the biggest problem is mindset. Having said that, and 
given that infrastructure is a big problem and will continue to be because our rate of investment is very low and it will probably continue to be because, I mean, it's very hard to invest in this country. I think that there are two areas that we could dramatically increase our integration. And it's very easy. One is data and the other is talent, as you said, right? I go to our Brazilian universities and I ask how many professors we have that are international here? None. None. Very few. I mean, the work visa problem, I mean, there is no reason why we shouldn't change that immediately. It's not, I mean, importing in a world of competing for talent and for ideas, importing people, right? I mean, you're adding to your GDP, right? Because these people, you know, bring intellectual capital that will produce in the country. So we should be eager to open the country and to import as much talent as we can, right? So that is in the benefit of all countries to open up, to get foreign talent. So, I mean, I keep talking to regular, I mean, I don't understand why it's so difficult to change those regulations. I mean, I'm, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not in the public sector and, and I have a lot of appreciation for, for public servants because it's very hard to, to effect change. But that is a clear, and the other is data, right? Data doesn't need, right, the railways or the ports in order to be interchanged. And um, when you have now a lot of these platforms that are being created, right? I mean, trade used to be a business of multinationals, right, in developed countries. Now, with the Alibabas and the Ebays and the platforms and the Amazons of the world, there are thousands and millions of com small companies that are being able to insert themselves, right? Um, that, uh, and we can exchange also data dramatically across the, I mean, across our our countries and to integrate and integrate so anyway I'm stop I'm gonna stop part of the financial <laughs> integration um, uh, Marcos but also part of the problem of being so close and the lack of openness means that many of our com economies compete in, in in several sectors so the integration would demand some kind of restructuring of our economy so uh, how, how do you see that 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 uh, in, in the short term I mean uh, Brazil and Mexico, how complementary are they? Yeah. Because the international trade is based on yeah. the theory of specialization, complementation. So. Now, the issue of complementarity is no doubt extremely important to try and devise how the future of integration in Latin America is going to be. But I think it would be fair to acknowledge that up until very recently, when you spoke to Latin America, there were essentially two kinds of integration structures being assembled. It was a sort of two-speed Latin America. On the one hand, you had countries like Mexico and, and Peru and Colombia and Chile organizing themselves the Pacific Alliance. They did some structural reform. They were more open to the world. They were under the umbrella, some of these countries, of the so-called Trans-Pacific um, Partnership. So more openness to the world, more connections to globalization. And then you had another block in which you could include countries like Brazil, Argentina, uh, Venezuela, maybe Uruguay, Ecuador, and they were sort of living under the aegis of what I like to call the import substitution industrialization 2.0, nacional desarrollismo, very strong role of the state as the shaper of demand. And these two mottos that I said were valid up until very recently were imploded by two different phenomena. One, of course, in the case of Brazil, Argentina, and so forth, the import substitution model was imploded by the fact that the incomes the coming from commodities were suffering a lot because of declining prices. And also the political system that surrounded such a model imploded as well, as it was very notably the case here in Brazil with impacts all over countries where uh, Brazilian champions had a, an important presence. And for uh, the countries of, of the Pacific Alliance, we also lost the context given deglobalization, given Brexit, and most important, given the election of Donald Trump in the United States and the United States walking away from TPP. So everyone is sort of, we don't have the rest anymore. In terms of the future of integration, let us separate at least three levels. Trade. Unfortunately, I do not see a lot there, especially for the thing, for the reasons that you have mentioned. La cuestión de las complementariedades. Um, it's been seven years, Alicia, that how published that beautiful text 
uh, on, on the issue of uh, the characteristics of Latin American development. So we are still, unfortunately, producers of very low value-added goods. We are still very strong in commodities. We have not changed in a dramatic way our specific role in the global economy. So what are the complementarities here? They're very, in, they're, they're very much limited when compared, for example, to the Southeast Asia Latin America equation or the European Latin America equation. So I don't see a lot of opportunities there. Where I do see a lot of opportunities is one, in the issue of infrastructure that Nicola was, was mentioning here. I go, to, I, I, go, I go to China a lot, and the last time I was there, I had the opportunity to speak to some uh, you know, people working at China's Development Bank, and I asked them, why is it that you do not invest in the so-called Bioshonic Railroad, right, that connects the Atlantic to the Pacific? It makes every bit of sense to you because of food security, because of your need to invest in infrastructure abroad. And said, listen, I would love to. But the thing is, for a project like that to take shape, you need at least the cooperation involving three or four countries. Because depending on the draft, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be coming out of Brazil, going through uh, uh, Bolivia, or coming out of Chile, or, or through Colombia. These governments have never really sat down to discuss something like that. Coordination in order to face an opportunity coming from abroad that, that's, so, that's so important. And the third, of course, level that I think yes, we have a chance here, is the issue of standards. Uh, last week, we had the approval of TPP Lite. It's not so much about trade. It's not so much about investment. It's about playing according to the same rules when it comes to government acquisitions, environmental legislation, labor legislations. Uh, I think in one, in, in, at one moment or another, the issue of intellectual property rights is gonna return to the table, so it's about that. So if we can coordinate also the kind of standards that each Latin American country is going to adopt for the future, this will be, I think, a very important piece of news when re-globalization comes, when, when Mr. Trump is gone, and I think this is going to be sooner rather than later. When the president government is rational, as was said in the, pan in the earlier panel. Um, quiero agradecer al secretario Secretary Gajardo, that is with us because his agenda is very complicated, is uh, facing the uh, commercial uh, trade with the U.S. Uh, his, his TPP is over, but last year, no. Now it's called TPP. So thank you, Secretary. As part of the negotiations, and because you are the promoter of this new entity that starts with inclusion with the route towards the Pacific, towards something bigger. And from the World Forum last year, there have been several meetings among the Mercosur governments to look for a possibility that these countries would be included within the Pacific route, and they could be within the CPTPP revised. I don't know. How uh, to begin with, well, firstly, I would begin by saying that we cannot be confused in the fact of having a certain circumstance in Washington with a different vision does not mean that the world has a new wave of protectionism. We must identify very clearly what is happening in the global context. On the one hand, we have Europe with a treaty with Canada that's been operating from as of September uh, 17, a new agreement between Mercosur and Europe, Mexico, with an agreement with the Europeans, the new definition that I I exists in CPTPP, that is a TPP without the U.S. with two frozen disciplines that were part of the <coughs> American interest. But if we analy analyze this, like Mercosur and Canada, there is a global response to send signals that we must continue with the commitment of globalization and the free trade. Even though we've had certain alerts from the point of view of certain failures of public policies, like Brexit, for instance, and what has been shown with the election in Washington. But we must be very concrete. We cannot make mistakes thinking that the commercial policy is a substitute of public policy. The opening is a condition for growth, but it is not the 
the only instrument to promote development and inclusion, and that is the mistake. What happened in the U.S. during 22 years of the a treaty with North America. Nobody was concerned with the changes of technological innovation. They should have thought of these new strategic sectors that were uh, left aside. This is the surprise of democracy because we don't have the right policies. So we should think of the different situations between the economies, either developed or in development, and what the public policies should be. The quality of treaties has improved in time, and we and must understand that one treaty may help very well a market, but they depend on disciplines. When Mexico relaunches the commercial preferences with Brazil and Argentina, one of the uh, um, conditions in Mexico was that to include the disciplines. And this part of the negotiation is very much uh, advanced because the biggest value is in the disciplines, in the certainty of the creation of new opportunities for investment and development. So within this context, and talking of the new challenge that we have in Washington, we understand that the challenge is not for Mexico and Canada but for the world after the definitions of the tariffs for steel and aluminum. Clearly, this is not only oriented towards China. We saw the meeting in Saturday between uh, uh, the ambassador and from China and U.S. There's a new concept from the point of view of fair trade in Washington. And for we, we will have our own uh, responses uh, each of us must have the, the, uh, our own responses, and we, but we must continue working for the opening in World Trade Organization. In the last two years, we've gone from 50 treaties of free trade registered to 350 free trade uh, uh, agreements. Even though Alicia is right that the meeting of OIM, uh, WTO uh, didn't have the results we expected in Buenos Aires, but we must understand the problems of WTO didn't start with the new government in Washington. No, the situation was complicated in order to build consensus with a group of countries that were kidnapping all the uh, results from Doha and uh, changes new uh, with new projects from with the information technology. So this starts with a real governance uh, problem independently from Washington. So in the region specifically and. I'll take my per the personal risk of what I'm going to say is not necessarily an agreement from our alliance, but after having signed the new CTPP in Santiago that took us one year to redefine the project, Mexico uh, presented four premises to go on. With this compression, Pacific Alliance has to take a new uh, way, a new direction because taking into account these four members, these four are part of CPTPP. Therefore, so that the Pacific Alliance may have a new opening, we must think of the Latin American integration. We must go beyond what we have dialogue with Mercosur that is easing, it is uh, cooperation, and we must give another step. We must think if facing these challenges that we are having with Washington to think of a real integration in Latin America, would there be a possibility that a Pacific Alliance would be a platform for integration that would lead us to a value added vis-a-vis -vis with the historical change that Argentina and Brazil are interested in this possibility. This is a change, and this is what we have to count on now. What should move us is to a bigger degree of integration. There is a complementarity uh, among countries. I would say that the first problem is the costs of uh, transactions in the trade in, of our region. They are very, very high, as it, it has been said. We have developed connectivity. We have to liberalize services uh, as to sea services and air infrastructure. but. Mainly, we must be 
aware that there are many complementarities. Mexico today is dependent of U.S. as to uh, food dependency. And these are options where our sector uh, agro, uh, agro and, uh, s development has had uh, has suffered problems. We had a free trade in this uh, auto, uh, auto uh, industry, um, but we are thinking now that our strengths will be complemented by the agro industry. I would like to add something to what the Secretary has said and all the others. We calculate how much is the cost of the lack of facilitation for business measured through a precarious infrastructure, customs, and difficult negotiations, especially in the sub invoicing in the frontiers. And this is equivalent to a 20% of tariffs the average of tariffs is 2.5. It's not so high. The region has been uh, bringing down the level of tariffs, but I believe this is due, specifically due to transportation, customs, and infrastructure. But I also want to add that we are moving from uh, goods to bids. The trade will be less material, and I think we must open up spaces for the movement of talents. And I believe that the digital market is a very important option. I believe that for Latin America, it is very possible to have a single digital market. But I want to add something. The globalization has led us to a transnationalization of production. And there were very successful companies, especially oil industry and energy in general. Nowadays, globalization or the new globalization is based more in transnationals of different types. We are talking of digital transnationals. And the business model is being changed in the region. And we understand this because this used to imply the denationalization of production and being able to be part of a, a, a value chain. China has adopted the model of substitution of imports. China is nowadays substituting importations of intermediary goods. We and many countries prefer the substitution of imports uh, uh, mistake uh, in, in, uh, uh, erroneously, but China is doing it with open economies. And I must say that this new way for of business in transnationals must be understood in order to understand understand this situation because the digital companies are opening up new opportunities for small and medium-sized enterprise in our region according to the cloud and the digital market. I believe, therefore, as the Secretary and others said, that we have to base ourselves on disciplines. We have been very general. We now have to focus on some disciplines or issues, such as agriculture. I believe that South America exports 80 percent uh, in terms of agriculture, South America is a region that has a surplus when it comes to food production. Now, the production of food is basic. It has no added value. Uh, soybeans, we continue to produce raw material. And of course, the tariffs increase in Europe, although they're very open. But the tariffs do not increase when they are value-added products. Exactly. Therefore, I think it is very important that we do look upon the complementariness and that ability of adding value to what we are doing. I'm going to mention an example. In the Pacific Alliance, the four countries export 85% of avocado. If they 
put the brand Pacific Alliance, if they become integrated in the market. There are difficulties, I understand, but I insist on this. I think it can be done. Even Europe would be willing to buy that brand, and that could represent a step forward. But we have to move to a higher level of speak, uh, to speak about how we can have joint trading companies, Latin American companies that will add the added value, that will market, that will become part of trade facilitation, and not allow entrepreneurs to act on their own. Trade agreements. But the most important miracle uh, the history of mankind has seen in the economic sphere, which is this brutal rise of China in the past 40 years, it's also celebrating an anniversary this year, was performed without international trade agreements exactly. and without regional integration with China's neighbors. Why did it happen? Because China had a strategy. Right? China had a right strategy that was open to it because it was given most favored nation status with trade in the United States and then later with Europe. They organized itself domestically to face these new opportunities. Today, of course, I don't want to uh, undervalue the importance of both international trade agreements and regional integration, but do our countries have a strategy? I don't think we do. No, not so having, having a strategy is as important as these two other platforms that have brought the prosperity to other nations. You could also mention uh, South Korea. Alicia uh, has said very correctly that many other nations in the world have also opted for in parts of substitution. China is one of them. It was in the past. It is today. Same thing with South Korea. South Korea. As a matter of fact, Edgar Dasman, who wrote a beautiful biography of, uh, of Raul Prebisch, was uh, uh, interviewed a couple of years ago, and he was asked, well, if, Pre if Prebish came back from the dead, and he was asked, is there any country in the world where you see your ideas flourishing? He says, yes, yeah, absolutely, South China. Korea, yeah. right? Yeah. So yeah. South Korea, the same thing, is import substitution in, our, in order to promote exports, not, not necessarily to cater to the yeah. domestic market. If I may add just a point here is, we talk a lot about US, right? But honestly, forget US. Yeah. US is the past. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, the future is Asia. Yeah. I mean, if a Martian or, I mean, I don't know because Elon Musk will go there, but maybe, I don't know, a guy from Jupiter would land here and say, you know, <laughs> what's the Earth? They would say, oh, the, the Earth is the Asia, and then there are a few suburbs somewhere else, right? right. Uh, uh, the, uh, the rest of the suburbs are irrelevant, and, and I think that the risk that we have is becoming irrelevant in the world with the center of gravity moving to Asia, right? China is the, already the largest foreign investor in Brazil, right? It's not US anymore, mm -hmm. right? They are buying everything, right? Uh, and it's not only energy. I mean, I mean we're talking but, about with mm, Chinese but climate. But they're somehow me, protectionist, no? What? They're somehow protectionist. Well, but, 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 but get to the point here, what Mark said is, uh, we Latin Americans are wonderful at improvising, but are terrible at planning, right? That's part of our culture. We look at the Olympics, you know, until one month before the Rio Olympics. What's going to happen? Ah, we don't know, but it will turn out well, right? And it did, right? We're great at improvising, but I think that some of these things, we have to do a little bit of planning before, right? I mean, well, I, I, mean, I see let, some, let me, some strategy in, in yeah, the let me, let me, I mean, in terms of the comment uh, that the countries have to have a plan, that's exactly what I was referring when you cannot just support on open and free trade policies. You have to have domestic policies. Give you a very simple example in the case of Mexico. I mean, once we integrated uh, to the North American market, the numbers are incredible. I mean, foreign investment, direct investment, before NAFTA, 2.5 billion. Today, every year, 33 billion. So it's uh, multiplied by 10. Exports from one to eight in multiple. But the point is that when we did NAFTA 22 years ago, we did not liberalize the energy market. We did not restructure, restructure the financial market. We did not do anything about uh, monopolies in the economy to try to get access Competition, to yeah. competitive inputs. So at the end of the day, al final del día, necesitamos realmente alinear las políticas públicas so con la apertura. Pero aquí la, la diferencia está. Vamos como el Estado a definir sectores ganadores. Is, 
o simplemente vamos a generar las condiciones para que un o if we're going to allow for an efficient and competitive market to gear the course of development, we cannot make mistakes because the new industrial policy within an open framework is not having the state selecting the winners. The market has to define the competitive advantages in an open framework where all sectors will have to be efficient. We will now offer the floor to the audience at large for their questions. A question to Ramirez, a very brief question. Augusto Fernandez from the Federal Confederation of Industries in Brazil. Why is it so difficult to come to an agreement between Brazil and Mexico from the Mexican perspective? Because for us, it's a target, but we feel there is resistance. I will try to be very transparent. We have two challenges. The first, we truly need to open up our competitive edge so that Mexico can have opening in the agro-industrial sector, in manufacturing, and in the automotive sector. We have a point pending that we need to resolve. After what happened with the AC-55, the Mexican sector has been highly resistant. They feel that the commitments of the past were not complied with. Our argument is that precisely because of this, we're recommending disciplines in the agreement so that going forward, any step backwards will have consequences, penalties within that context of disciplines. Yes, the conditions are there. It is fundamental to move forward in this negotiation because it will be fundamental for a negotiation with North America. And the agricultural sector of the United States is supporting a renegotiation of NAFTA because the strategy for import substitutions will depend on the agricultural capacity of Brazil and Argentina. As a government representative, I am pushing towards this negotiation. It is not simple to face the animosity of the private sector because of past experiences, but I think the issue of disciplines will allow us to move forward. Alejandro, which is the obstacle for integration with Brazil? I think that the secretary has summarized this very clearly. The automotive agreement with Brazil created that bitter taste in Mexico. They were unaware of the treaty, and they set forth a quota for the import of Mexican automobiles. And this has led to skepticism in continuing with the treaty. As the secretary has just mentioned, if we include these disciplines in the treaty, I think both countries could benefit greatly and could reach a broader, uh, more extensive agreement, allowing us to uh, benefit from the agribusiness capacity of Brazil, and Brazil could take advantage of the cheaper manufacturing from Mexico. Additional questions, Noel Gutierrez from Mexico. My question refers to talent. As the economy becomes ever more digital and as it becomes more important to share between countries, which is a possibility of having a greater movement of talent in Latin America? Well, unfortunately, we don't have a Brazilian representative here. Is there a representative from the Brazilian government that has knowledge on this situation? What I would like to add to this question, I'm Paulo Sotero from the Wilson Center Brazil Institute in Washington. but. I'm a native of Brazil, and that is why I am addressing you in Portuguese. The issue of the talents. Marcos, we know that in Brazil, some very successful experiences took place within international 
and scientific cooperation. Petrobras is thanks to years of cooperation between engineers from the U.S. and other countries. Brazilian agriculture is what it is thanks to 60 years of cooperation between universities of Sao Paulo with universities from France and the United States. This has led to the most productive agriculture in the farms. We do have a problem with infrastructure. This is how we also created the third largest aviation company, an agreement of the Air Force of Brazil and the MIT, which ended up with the best engineering school in Latin America, the ITA Embraer that once it became privatized became a large company. Now, I would like to know why in Brazil it is so difficult to remember our history because we did the right things to produce talents. If a university closes down, we need to open it up. If the university is closed, our talents will go to other countries. I would like you to refer to that that I try to approach it to the etymology of the word, which is talent means inclination, right? So for example, for Latin American country, what is the talent, the comparative advantages of agricultural exports? For, for a particular company, it's do more of what it does best. For an individual, it's your vocation, is that voice that you hear within you. That's originally the tradition, the notion of talent, and I agree with you that, that Brazil and many other Latin American countries enjoyed those. But with this new context of the so-called fourth industrial revolution, the same way that in the 80s we uh, talked about reverse engineering, we have to talk about reverse talent. So you're very good at agriculture, very good. You have to be a, 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 a producer, a manufacturer of, of, of large airplanes. Your company is in, uh, is, in, is in medicine. Well, it has to fare well also in the technology sector. You're engineer, you have to understand poetry, right? The examples that you have just mentioned in the case of Brazil, like Embraer, are exactly the kind of sample that we can extract from adding a new quality to the things that you already do best. This is what I think the fourth industrial revolution is going to be all about. And we are going to have to invest. We're going to have to liberate resources that are going to other things to, to foster the rescaling capacities, the training that are, that are so needed. Otherwise, not only Brazil, but other countries in Latin America will reach the situation in which by the age of 25, these naturally talented people were not given the talent tools of the 21st century. But like decades in the past, life expectancy at birth, even for a middle income country like Brazil, is 75 years of age. So what is it that you're going to do with your life from 25 to 75? You're going to be useless useless to this talent intensive economy, but you're going to be very useful to piracy, to drug trafficking, to the illegal commerce of arms. It's something that we certainly I, do not want. I, I, want. I would like to add, I mean, if you allow me, on the issue of, I mean, that he mentioned, I think those are exceptions uh, that prove the rule. And I think that we look at Brazil, the history of Brazil is the society claimed for freedom, political freedom because of the dictatorship and economic stabilization. Those were the two biggest demands from society from 1960 to 1995 until stabilization. And in those 30 years, society, civil society, absolutely forgot education. Education in Brazil is a tragedy. That's the best word that describes education in this country. And the education system Latin America, no? in no. Brazil was hijacked, hijacked by the ideologists that used the universities in order to instill socialist mindset in students and in professors. That's what happened for 35 years. And we, social society, and leaders of the country closed our eyes, and we didn't even care about that. We didn't remember that. And it was only in the late 90s or early 2000s that we had the first social, I mean, civil movement in Brazil called Todos pela Educação that we started to think about that and is trying, now the society is understanding that this is a big problem, right? But it will take another decades to solve. I think that, you know, the education has been hijacked. 
Alicia, sí, tú tú justamente. Tema de, de, la circula, de los dos temas, tanto del tema de educación y desarrollo. Two topics, tema, education and development and the circulation of regional talent. Alejandro has told us that it's not easy to take a person from Brazil to Mexico and vice versa. Can CAM, the Andean Community of Nations, is the only partnership that allows for the free movement, and Mercosur has made advances in this. I think that in the long run, we have to open up to the movement of people, especially people with higher education. There should be a definite opening, in this, and this depends on migration policies. In Latin America, we have 165 million young people between 16 and 29 years of age. And at present, we have room for investment, but not in any type of education. I would like to mention Previs, who spoke about the ability to absorb technical progress. And technical progress is full steam, and our education is crawling behind. I think Brazil has greater technical capacity than the rest of Latin America. It has research institutions, very powerful universities as well as Mexico. We do have that in our region. Now, why don't we go from this technical and scientific ability to practice? What is lacking, perhaps, is a dialogue with the private sector to see which is the type of talent the private sector needs so that our educational institutions can reorient their programs in that direction. We also have to move forward in higher education and in technical education. We have a serious problem in the reskilling of present-day workers. I'm afraid our time is up. Perhaps uh, there is a final comment. We have said that regional integration is a need. There are obstacles such as infrastructure, education, the movement of talent, red tape at customs, that there are many opportunities. Well, this background, uh, I think conditions will come together in time, as we see at present, due to that challenge of a new vision for Washington. And the alternative for Latin America is to effectively and realistically think about the regional integration and to do this insistently with the CPTPP to have a deeper integration that we have at present. And subsequently, this would imply this integration with the CPTPP eventually, of course, or perhaps an expansion of the Pacific Alliance and its context. Thank you very much. And we expect news in this field.